Uh, okay. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mabir. I'm from Palestine, uh, and I'm recently joined CB Sulfur teams, and I'm really excited for the case of today. So, yeah. Right on. Do you want me to buzz more and more? What do you like to do outside of uh, tuning into case conference and doing medicine? Yeah, um, I love singing, specifically old Arabic song. Uh, also, I love painting and walking. So yeah, even that I'm not a professional artist, but I, I love painting. Well, wow, what kind of paints? Oil painting, water watercolor? Watercolor. Cool, that's awesome. Very cool. Well, next time we'll ask you, in addition to bringing a case, to bring a picture to show us. Okay. Looks like you have uh, some fellow watercolors in the chat, too. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, uh, Ashkosh, well, why, don't, why don't you go ahead and take over the whiteboard, and uh, we can go ahead and get started. Abir, take us away with the case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a patient. I will start. A 34-year-old man, uh, a bodybuilder with no significant past medical or surgical history, presented with calf pain for the past four days. The patient was previously in his usual state of health. Until two weeks ago, he developed a documented fever, so he sought medical advice at the outpatient clinic, and he was treated as a case of a strep throat with amoxiclav, as he mentioned, uh, and the patient only took two tablets of antibiotics. Then the fever resolved, but he subsequently developed severe cramping muscle pain in bilateral calf muscles without radiation, experiencing difficulty walking, especially with climbing the stairs or covering more than a few steps. Then he, seek, uh, he sought further assistance and he visited emergency room. So yeah, I will start here. I will stop here. Thank you so much, Abir. It's so nice to meet you. And uh, thank you for presenting this case. Uh, I'll focus on the calf pain, like acute onset calf pain, and then kind of leave the background to Jack to help and for, uh, to help think through how that is changing that um, differential. So, you know, we have a, and I'm uh, sorry, the patient was a 34 or 54? 34. 34. 34. Okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. Thank you. So uh, we have a, a young man coming in with calf pain. So just kind of thinking about calf pain itself. So, you know, whenever in doubt, anatomy is a good uh, place to fall back on. So thinking about the calf itself. So thinking about what does it for us need to be able to use those muscles to walk, uh, and where the pathology could be. So the one thing, you know, one of our new misdiagnoses when it comes to kind of this severe uh, limb pain is the vasculature, right? So is there any reason to have like arterial insufficiency, especially if the pain is like much worse with movement? And uh, to thinking about, is there any way, uh, any reason why the flow to the muscles are compromised? Um, the other aspect, you know, with the, uh, with with the arterial blood flow is in the venous flow. Is there any clots there, you know, especially in the setting of recent illness? Is this a person who is at risk of uh, like a DVT that is presenting as calf pain? Um, and then, you know, uh, what connects the two, you know, like syndromes that like APLS that, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, can present with more arterial and venous clot formations too. So thinking about the blood itself as well, as well as like any anatomical issues with the vasculature there. Um, then, um, you know, th after the vasculature, thinking about kind of like the muscles themselves, um, are there any reasons for a patient to have a myositis type of uh, a picture? died like you know uh the fact that it's like more localized make it a little less likely. However, like any myopathy or muscle issues itself, I uh, can do it. And then the other thing is like the skin itself. So, you know, uh, on cellulitis, um, calciphylaxis, there are lesions that uh, cause a lot of pain. So any reasons to have any skin findings or any painful rashes, um, uh, infections that can cause like significant calf pain as well. So vasculature muscles and then the skin itself is kind of the compartment I'm thinking about and you know 
Uh, the other thing is the complications uh, of uh, local issues like kind of compartment syndromes. Uh, so thinking about uh, asking about like tenseness, if there's any like edema there as well is another aspect of it that I'm uh, thinking about. Uh, Jack, what do you think about the other information? Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting to sort of try to play with some of some of the different combination of symptoms here. I'm like um, sort of forcing myself out of the um, CPS world and just to be like, what would I be thinking if I saw this gentleman in the urgent care clinic? And I think if somebody had what sounded like maybe a bacterial or a viral syndrome and was like, my muscles kind of ache a little bit, I think, yeah, that sounds like you have a little bit of a viral syndrome. And it makes sense to me that you're feeling a little bit, a little bit achy. But where things I think start to change for me is that there seems like those symptoms are actually starting to uncouple from one another, right? We had fevers in a sore throat, as well as some achiness in the calves. We gave antibiotics and one got better and something else has continued to worse to, to, um, I should say has continue to worsen. And um, uh, I think separating those out now, I think what I'm really focusing on is this is somebody who has, as you were saying, Charmaine, bilateral calf pain. And I think I'm sort of, sort of um, shit, using that same approach that you are, that you articulated. It's easy to get pulled into the post-streptococcal, post-streptococcal complications early on in this case, but none of the features of the case yet map onto some of those characteristic post-strep features, right? Things like we're not seeing things like renal dysfunction. We're not seeing things like cardiac dis dis dysfunction. We're not seeing predominantly an arthritis. The other sort of framework I sort of rattled through in my brain very quickly was just like antibiotics plus calf pain. And I don't think about penicillin antibiotics doing that, but rather the fluoroquinolones. You can get a fluoroquinolone associated Achilles tendinopathy or Achilles tendon rupture, but the drug that this patient received isn't the correct one for that. So I think for me, I'm in the same boat you were in terms of the approach to bilateral calf pain. Is this a vessel problem, a muscle problem, or something related to the superficial structures of the skin or... um um uh, yeah, I guess really those would be, I think, the big um, the big three there that you articulated. So I'm curious to see where it goes, but I think it's hard to merge the two together yet. But again, uh, the jury's still out in terms of how the case unf un unfolds. Yeah, uh, nice discussion. And I think we are, until now we are in the same boat. In the emergency room, regarding the phys physical exam, including a neuro, uh, nothing was significant. So the provisional diagnosis was either post-viral or drug-induced myositis. So the patient discharged with analgesia, but uh, after one day, the patient came back to emergency room with worse leg pain, and the pain didn't get better even with pain medication. He didn't have a fever, uh, night sweats, weight loss, chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, diarrhea, urinary issues, or a change in urine color. In physical exam, the patient was conscious, alert, in well shared, chair, vital staple, chest exam revealed normal physical breathing sound with good bilateral air entry. Nothing wa was significant, even abdomen, lower limb examination, by inspection, no redness is falling or sign of infection or DVT. And palpation revealed severe tenderness over the gastrocnemius muscles bilaterally. Uh, muscle power was graded five out, uh, out, out five. Sensation was intact. Um, would you like to to show also initial laboratory finding to share with you initial laboratory finding? Uh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. White blood cells slightly elevated, ten point seven neutrophilic predominant, C-reactive protein eight point nine, which is slightly elevated from the last visit, which was six point seven, platelet. 600, also an increase from the last visit, CBK 33, which decreased from the last visit, which was 59. A complete metabolic panel, nothing significant. Urine analysis, nothing significant, but they are slightly elevated in ALT and AST. Yes, and I will stop here. All right. Well, I will go ahead and just talk briefly about the exam, and then I will leave it up to you, to to you, Charmaine, to take us through some of the labs and everything. You know, I think at least what 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 happens from this aliquot is that we get a much better characterization of the problem space that we're in. And I think given that we're not seeing any redness of the superficial tissues, or I should say of the superficial skin and soft tissues, we're not seeing any swelling. That makes for me the probability 
of um, both a skin and soft tissue infection like cellulitis and a deep vein thrombosis less likely. What we do see is that there's prominent bilateral calf pain that's present on exam, which I think further supports the working hypothesis that Abir mentioned of, of some, some sort of myositis. Um, it sounds like this myositis um, uh, was maybe present um, at the initial evaluation, but certainly still seems to be ongoing. And so I think the problem space that we're finding ourselves in, we can say it seems like this person has a distal lower extremity, relatively symmetric bilateral myositis. Um, and then um, uh, I think some of the labs can help us um, maybe understand that better. But I think um, it's going to be really interesting to see how we explore um, what the underlying cause of this is. Uh, yeah, I love that, Jack. And kind of looking through the labs, oh, it uh, looks like, you know, he's inflamed of some sort, like looking at that, um, the one of the um, labs that jumped out to me is the platelets of 600,000. Um, and to uh, think about like, you know, thrombocytosis, I often think about, you know, that being reactive versus a clonal primary, like a myeloproliferative disorder that is like often less likely. Um, so it's always like good to also take a look at the trends previously, especially, you know, he's like 34 years old, but the platelet's normal if he had any other labs. Um, there are like some familial component of it. However, you know, in the context of summing in with like bila a bilateral um calf pain, um, white count that is like a little bit on the higher and a little bit of elevated CRP makes me uh, think about the reactive processes. And that's oftentimes I think about inflammation and um, inflammation so can do it like, you know, some autoimmune, especially seronegative, uh, a lot, um, some of the vasculitides often present with thrombocytosis. Um, infections, oftentimes more subacute infections can also present uh, rather than like acutely, uh, like more subacute chronic chronic infections can cause um, that and like cancers, uh, oftentimes solid cancers can uh, pre uh, present uh, that way. And, you know, a trauma, tissue damage, it can often cause thrombocytosis as well. Um, the one thing, you know, with the degree of the pain uh, uh, he has, I don't want to lose sight of, uh, and the fact that is like kind of symmetric and bilateral, uh, don't want to lose the sight of vasculature. And the other thing is also, um, I'm not sure in terms of the quality of pain to also think about like kind of a neuropathy type issue um, as well, given the, um, uh, given the locations of them being more distal. Um, in terms of like the myositis itself, uh, like I, the, you know, oftentimes with rhabdo and stuff, we see more, more elevated CKs. Um, in terms of like, oh, and the ASC and ALT that are being elevated, you know, ASC, ALT, we often think about it, oh, as, you know, liver. However, you know, your muscles, um, like skeletal muscles also can, especially with the ASC, uh, can have, you uh, uh, those inside. So if they're bursting, uh, then you can have like a mildly elevated um, AST as well. So all of it that kind of uh, points towards an like an inflammatory process that involves uh, these two, uh, these two muscles. Um, and then the question is like, is there any other muscles involved? It doesn't seem like it has this having any pain. Um, what I would like to do next is actually start um, with some imaging. Um, I, I would still like you know, thinking about no misdiagnosis, we would love a vasculature um, evaluation. And then um, thinking about like, you know, something like an MRI to better char uh, character characterize the muscle involvement and whether like a biopsy would be helpful. Anything else to add, Jack? No, I've, um, I think, you know, the only other thing I'm thinking about here is sort of just um, going back over some of the information that we have here and just and really being like, um, how were some of these diagnoses formally solidified? Because I think from one perspective, if it was a confirmed diagnosis of strep throat, like positive strep antigen or positive culture, we're very much in sort of the post, or I couldn't at least think about the post strep space. But um, in thinking about the sequence and the tempo of the different findings here, it sounds like we have upper respiratory infection, antibiotics exposure, and then muscle findings that have, de that have developed later. Later. And while I don't have in my mind a sequence of events for strep plus antibiotics leading to problems with 
soft tissues. I do have in my mind the possibility of Epstein-Barr virus plus antibiotics sometimes sometimes leading leading to some of those issues. And so I would I think um uh, would be thinking here about like would it be worth revisiting exactly how the diagnosis of strep throat was made? Was it a presumed empiric diagnosis, or are we dealing with another? Um, uh, pharyngitic illness, of which mono could be one of the ones. Um, I think characteristically that mono can cause, um, there can be a rash that develops with EBV after exposure to penicillin antibiotics. Uh, but I think that if we think about sort of immune mediated, or um, maybe I can say it differently, there are some viral infections that set somebody up for immune mediated complications. And we see EBV do this in lots of ways. EBV can cause an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. EBV can cause um, or can can lead to the development of certain rashes. And so in my mind here, I think the other pathway that I'm thinking about is upper respiratory viral infection plus antibiotics leading to some sort of autoimmune phenomenon. In this case, it would be a myositic autoimmune phenomenon, which I think puts me into the polymyositis or dermatomyositis space, but we're not seeing any of the characteristic skin findings yet. But I think that's just another chain of reasoning that has unfolded and, being like, and after sort of feeling stuck because none of these findings are so super typical of post strep, but there may be other upper respiratory viral infections where antibiotics can set off immune mediated phenomena. Yeah. Okay. So I want to continue. I love this question, so I will continue. Uh, our, yeah. So we consider it could be infectious process. It could be bacterial or viral infection or some inflammatory process like autoimmune uh, or other granulomatous disease or some rheumatological disease, or it could be malignancy. So we consulted rheumatologist, rheumatologist doctor, and our further investigation and including well, rheumato uh, rheumatoid factor was negative and anti-CCP also negative, ferritin, haptoglobin, seroplasmin also normal, TSH normal, um, low level of IgG, uh, less than uh, uh, 700, which was uh, 600, uh, isolated IgG, isolated uh, immunoglobulin, decrease in immunoglobulin level, other immunoglobulin was uh, where we, with a normal range, slightly elevated ALT still, positive epitchin bar viral uh, IgG, including viral capsid and in, in nuclear antigen, uh, high titer IgG, uh, but IgM viral capsid was uh, borderline. So we uh, we test PCR epitchin bite virus, which was negative. Coxilla leptospiriosis also negative. Other viral panels also negative. Uh, ANA, ANCA, anti double stranded DNA, anti Smith, anti Joe was negative. Um, regarding the imaging, chest CT. So pulmonary nodule, I will just uh, say the significant finding. Pulmonary nodules up to three millimeters in the upper right loop, and there are lymphadenopathy in the left armpit around 1.1 centimeter. Um, abdominal and pelvis CT scan showed two retroperitoneal lymph nodes with a necrotic center about 2.5 centimeter surrounded by fatty tissue. Um, and also we have an inguinal lymph node uh, surrounded by approximately one centimeter. Um, and there's small hypodense finding uh, in pancreatic tissue, approximately three millimeters. Um, CALF MRI showed patchy hyper intense T2 signaling, uh, which showed a sign of muscle edema, which may align with myositis. And I will stop here. All right. <laughs> Where do we begin? So uh, actually, Jack, since you were uh, talking about the EBV, do you want to just comment on the EBV studies? Oh, sure. Um, uh, take all this with a grain of salt, because I have looked this up 100 times and forgotten it 200 times. Um, but uh, I will say that the conclusion that I'm drawing from this is that this is somebody who has previously been exposed to EBV, but has a low probability of active EBV infection. I think a lot of the viral testing is very, very difficult to interpret and understand. But I think the sort of hallmark principles that I rely on is like active PCR should be positive if there's active EBV. 
IgM is usually positive, but not always if there's active infection. And IgG offers very little significance given the base rate of prior exposure in the general population. So because we only have the IgG being positive here, but the markers of active infection of PCR and IgM are negative, I think that that decreases the probability of active EBV infection quite a lot. Boom. I'm, that's that's how I think about it too. So if you're wrong, we're wrong <laughs> together, friend. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's um, then think about the space that we're in right now. So we have a 34 year old with recent diagnosis of pharyngitis that is post treatment for strep throat who is presenting with kind of acute onset calf pain with imaging like concerning for like a my myositis picture. Also found to have kind of a diffuse lymphadenopathy and pulmonary nodules, like serological for uh, workup largely negative for like infectious autoimmune diseases. Um, so where we are right now, so it sounds like we're dealing with a, a systemic inflammatory process. Um, and in regards to what that inflammatory process is, um, how can we how, how can we use like the pulmonary nodules or the lymphadenopathy to make progress? Unfortunately, I don't think our differentials are getting any smaller. Um, the thing with the diffuse lymphadenopathy that you want to think about in someone who is young is definitely lymphoma. Again, like thrombocytosis is not really uh, like that I associate with liquid tumors. However, it can be a sign of uh, reactive inflammation. Again, like you can have myeloproliferative disorders associated with the thrombocytosis as well. So I think like getting um, a biopsy results um, like of, of one of those lymph nodes will be really informative that protects the structures. The other thing to kind of think about, you know, is like kind of subacute infections and you have the granulomatous process. We don't see any other um, marks um, of it. But again, like pulmonary involvement, diffuse lymphadenopathies, um, there are a whole slew of infections uh, that can do that. And then the other thing that with the pulmonary nodules, and kind of um, uh, was I think about like autoimmune diseases, like vasculitides, uh, you know, at least like small vessel vasculitides, I haven't seen anything like uh, in the kidneys. However, you know, um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of them can present with like pulmonary first. Um, different versions of them have uh, different like from like GPA, especially like with pulmonary nodules and um, if anything in like upper respiratory um, a tract makes me uh, want to consider that as well. So another thing uh, like we can send anchor serologies just to be on the safe side. So. What would I do next? I would definitely want a lymph node biopsy if it's accessible uh, to make sure it's not lymphoma to stain for um, infection, especially with granulomatous process as well. Um, Jack, any additional thoughts? I don't think I have anything to add. Yeah, I think just to sort of touch a little bit on some of the some of the autoimmune antibodies that were tested here. We were saying that I think one of the questions is like, is this a infection that is driving a systemic inflammatory process characterized by myositis and lymphadenopathy? Or is this an infection that has set off an autoimmune phenomenon that is narrowly characterized by some of these findings? And it may seem like it's a semantic argument, but the treatment for them can end up can end up looking different. And so all of these antibodies that Abir and the team sent in can help us a little bit. Um, I think if we were to be thinking about um, some of the different autoimmune studies, it'd be the ones that you mentioned, Charmaine, a small vessel vasculitis versus something in the polymyositis, dermatomyositis space. Um, uh, the ANCAs, I think I might've heard that the ANCAs were negative, but I may have just, I may have totally missed that. And we have some of these different autoantibodies for polymyositis and dermatomyositis, but not all of them. And it can be helpful to think about the fact that there are um, myositis associated antibodies and myositis specific antibodies when it comes to the autoimmune dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Some of the ones here like anti-JO, um, uh, even ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA, these can sometimes fall in the myositis associated category, but there's a whole longer list of the myositis specific ones that um, oftentimes will end up being negative in a case like this, but still it can be helpful to still send that full comprehensive panel to really falsify them because the spectrum can be so heterogeneous of these um, of the of the DM and PM diseases um, that sometimes um, just looking for if the antibodies are present are present can be helpful here. But I'm with you. I think you know trying to go after one of the lymph nodes and or going after 
um, the inflamed muscle is likely to be helpful here. The path from the muscle biopsy won't necessarily give us an answer, but what we see there can be helpful in some ways. Um, if you see just lots of inflammatory cells, it confirms myositis. Sometimes we see necrotizing myositis on the biopsy, which puts us into another subcategory of myositis that's associated with things like anti-HMG CoA reductase antibody or anti-SRP antibody. That necrotizing inflammatory myop, um, necrotizing inflammatory myositis is a more aggressive category that sometimes warrants more aggressive treatment. So the biopsy there could help with that. And then I agree with you, Charmaine, we probably wouldn't stop at the calf muscle biopsy, but also want to understand what's happening in these lymph nodes, because if it is, um, again, it's unlikely, but if it is an, an autoimmune dermatomyositis, these can also have a high association or some can have a high association with cancer. And so taking a broad approach to tissue diagnosis can be helpful here. Amazing discussion. And I, I would like to add another differential for your amazing differential. Uh, other than granulomatous inflammation, malignancy, as lymphoma, there is a rare condition called gaguchi fajomoto disease. Uh, I hope that I don't mistake in pronunci pronunciation. No, I that was perfect. Okay. Uh, it's a self-limited disease, and the patient presents mostly with, with posterior cervical lymphadenopathy, fever, and myalgia, and there's some rare uh, was published uh, with retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy uh, with central necrosis. Uh, this is an extra point. Yeah. So our patient, also we do further investigation like interferon gamma releasing assay to rule out TB, which was negative. Uh, also HIV, HTL, and one was negative. Uh, so Based on the imaging finding, a biopsy has now become mandatory. So a retroperitoneal lymph node biopsy was uh, uh, retroperitoneal lymph node biopsy and uh, was done uh, guided by CT, CT scan. Uh, and uh, I would like to to tell you where is the retroperitoneal biopsy, where the retroperitoneal lymph node was exactly being. And the pedinephric abscess adjacent to the kidney, uh, to the border, in, relatively in the border of the kidney. So it was difficult to take this uh, lymph node uh, to biopsy, uh, uh, as biopsy, but it was. Uh, and the result of immunohistochemical stain was positive for uh, chromogranin and JATA3 or synaptophysin, uh, and negative for PAN3K, SF1, and PAX8 and SOX10. And this is, will be the final liquid for the final diagnosis. Oh, I wish I knew what those um, abbreviations that you shared about the pathfinding meant, but um, uh, uh, I know I see uh, I see that you put them in the chat uh, and I can read them. Um, I have no idea what any of those means. I think some of them, I like chromogranin, maybe associate with some um, neuroendocrine tumors, but that's as far as I can take it. Um, uh, the path markers are not a strong suit of mine. What are your thoughts, Charmaine? Um, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Abir, please tell us. Tell us what the final diagnosis is. Yeah, you are correct. Uh, the final diagnosis was specifically pyroganglioma, which is a type of a neuroendocrine tumor. Wow. And how did you all reconcile the myositis? Is that associated with this type of tumor or was that separate from the underlying cancer? The actual cause, uh, we didn't find the actual cause or a relationship between baraganglioma and myositis or, but maybe we can link it as myalgia and other like malignancy and lymphoma may present with myalgia and with whatever, but we we didn't find the actual cause for myositis. Interesting. Or yeah. Wow. So yeah, we consulted the neuroendocrine team and our patient was transferred to the surgeon. Wow. Thank you so much, Beer. This is a really, um, this is one of those cases that I'm going to learn a lot from um, uh, over time here, because I think there, uh, 
is much, much reading for me to do about both of these sort of different different problem spaces that we got to explore. Um, but uh, yeah, a really fascinating way that this case unfolded. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. This is fascinating. I have much to learn. All right, Kishal, take us away with the teaching points for this case. It's an amazing case as usual from Avir, and I love the discussion. And, uh, there's just so much to learn, and it's it's interesting that after the dermatomyositis case last week to have this again with our whole body on a half day. And the, my teaching points are the main one which I learned was uh, one to see the acute calf pain and how to approach it anatomically. And uh, I will see it's either vasculature, it could be because of obstruction in uh, venous flow, or it could be arterial issue, or it could be because of the anatomical issue or antibodies like APLS, or it could be because of myositis, or it could be because of skin lesions like painful rashes, or also to consider local compartment syndrome. And um, when the patient is having vasculitis or myology associated with infection, it could be either because of the infection, infectious etiology itself, or it could be because of the treatment for the infection with antibiotics like fluoroquinolones, which can cause tendinitis. And uh, when the patient is having uh, elevated platelets to rule out whether it's because of the active to the infection or to the trauma, and um, when they're having increased AS, AST and ALP, apart from a liver issue, it could also be due to uh, muscle involvement. And to be able to rule it out, we would have to do imaging to either like vascular Doppler, MRI, as well as the biopsy. And uh, in this, uh, further in the studies, we were having um, uh, EDD was what considers as diagnosis. And if the patient is having an IgG positive, it just shows they had a past infection and doesn't rule out a current infection. And later on, when the patient is like diagnosed to have diffuse lymph cardinopathy, we would have to take it in consideration with other findings like thrombocytosis and pulmonary nodules. And we could, it could be because of malignancy, vasculitis, or infection. And to further help us with diagnosis, it's important to get a lymph node biopsy and also to do antiserology and antibodies, um, which are both specific and associated with um, muscle issue. Um, in this case, the patient was positive for synaptophysin as well as chromogranin. Uh, from the lymph node biopsy, and then that was uh, helped us with diagnosis of paraganglioma, of OMI, which is a neuroendocrine tumor. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kachal. Thank you for uh, summarizing the case so eloquently. Um, and Abir, thank you again for bringing such a phenomenal case for us today. Uh, last but not least, Ashutosh, thank you for scribing um, uh, uh, all of the really rich data in this case. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon, um, and we'll catch you next time on VMR. Take care, y'all.